Chapter 81, Pintalk Compiler's Note During the time of increasing unrest in Sand City and the surrounding areas, officials and administrators sought to study the issues and have conversations. The university was asked to host and sponsor a convocation, but declined since doing so would necessitate the inclusion of conservative speakers, including some Christian leaders. After much heated discussion, threats from both sides, that of student rioting if allowed, and that of a funding cutoff if not allowed, a compromise was reached. The university would neither sponsor nor host the convocation. Rather, the university would rent its facilities during a holiday time when no classes were held and no students were in attendance. Watchman Pintock was invited to speak on a topic of his choice. There was no requirement for a copy of his presentation either prior to or after the conference. His agreement to be a presenter included the restrictions that his presentation be related to the main theme of the conference and that it make no reference to the Sandman religion. He agreed. Two people from his congregation wrote down what was said during that session. All questions that he received, as well as his responses, were written down by the two scribes and have been included in this account. A copy of the manuscript was made and kept by one of the two people taking dictation. The original manuscript was lost when the occupying forces of the Sandmen destroyed the Sand City Tower, along with its contents including sanctuary furniture, paraments, books, church records, and communion ware. What follows is from the copy, and there is no scolia or commentary concerning reactions or emotions from those in attendance. The opportunity to be a part of this conference and make this presentation in one of its sessions is a distinct privilege and honor for me. The theme for your consideration in this session is The Christian's Life in the Two Kingdoms, and it is divided into two parts. First, Definitions and Distinctions, and second, Doctrines and Applications. Hopefully there will be some time at the end for a few questions and answers. It is my sincere hope and desire that the substance of this theme and my presentation are neither inflammatory nor divisive. If it clarifies and contributes to constructive conversation among all of us, then it will meet the first objective. If it educates and promotes an understanding of the Christian's life in both kingdoms, then it will have met the second objective. Now, I'm not so naive as to believe that there will not be criticism. You and I both know that there will be opposition from many who are not Christians. I am also aware that there will be those within the Christian community who will vehemently oppose what is about to be presented. So be it. Let's dig into it. Please picture in your mind the following scene. Jesus, the King of Kings, stands before a local ruler named Pontius Pilate. The Son of God is about to be sentenced to death by this cowardly man. Before that happens, Jesus says to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. John 18.36 Right there, in that declaration, is the basis for the doctrine of the two kingdoms. There are worldly kingdoms, and there is Christ's kingdom. For the sake of clarity and to reflect reality, Christ's kingdom is going to be referred to as the kingdom of the right hand of God. For the crucified, risen, and ascended Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. All the kingdoms of this world, whether queendoms, republics, oligarchies, democracies, etc., are referred to here as the kingdom of the left hand of God. For ease, we will simply refer to them as the kingdom of the left and the kingdom of the right. Let's begin by looking at a few similarities and differences. We're not going to go too deeply into the theological nuances, but rather get into how these two kingdoms operate and apply. To begin with, the Lord God reigns over both kingdoms, but not directly. In both kingdoms, he reigns over them by his appointed and instituted means. The Lord God rules over the kingdom of the left, which is, once again, the worldly kingdoms, doing so by means of law. In this, while God knows all things, he is not the one who might be called a micromanager. Peoples, nations, communities, and so forth are able to determine what form of government to have. As mentioned a moment ago, 
and what laws to have and enforce. One nation will be in the form of a democracy, and the people will determine what laws to have and enforce. In another form of government, the various laws and their enforcement are under a dictator. Those charged with and having authority to legislate, administer, judge, and execute the laws are called the governing authorities. In his letter to the Romans, who were living under the cruel reign and rule of various Caesars, the Holy Spirit, via the Apostle Paul, instructs Christians of all ages to be subject to the governing authorities. In the thirteenth chapter of that epistle, Christians are reminded of their duties and responsibilities to the kingdom of the left. Rather than me tell you of that, please bear with my reading of seven verses. They are much clearer and succinct than anything I could state. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of him who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay all of them their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Romans 13, 1-7 a quick word of commentary before moving on. History records, and we are well aware of the fact, that there are corrupt officials and evil leaders. God allows this to happen when he rules through the means of man's law and sinful people. Christians are expected to abide by these governing authorities as well, with one exception, which we will address in a few moments. Our theme is the Christian's life in the two kingdoms. The Christian has responsibilities and obligations in the kingdom of the left. Being a Christian does not excuse one from these, but rather actually increases them. Now let's move on to the kingdom of the right, which is Christ's kingdom. It is not of this world, but rather comes down to us from above, from the throne of God and his unveiled presence where there are angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. Although still here on this earth and in this life, Christians are members of the kingdom of the right. Christ Jesus reigns over and rules his kingdom, not by the law, but by the gospel, which is the promised salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Jesus has provided the forgiveness of sins, the bestowal of eternal life, and the gift of salvation through his instituted means of grace, the ways we receive here and now what Jesus the Christ accomplished more than two and a half millennia ago. The kingdom of the left is given the right to bear the sword, which is to punish lawbreakers even to the point of capital punishment. The kingdom of the right does not have the right to bear the sword. The most radical thing a Christian can do to you is to tell you that, by the grace of God through faith in Christ, you are forgiven of all your sins. The means whereby Christ's forgiveness, eternal life, and salvation, earned many centuries ago, are brought to us today, is by the word of the gospel, by baptism, absolution, and the Lord's Supper. These are the means of grace, and they are normally administered to Christian congregations by called and ordained servants of the word. These qualified and called men have various titles. Here it is watchmen. At other times and places, they were called pastors, elders, bishops, under-shepherds, and so forth. Since God also works through such simple means as the word of God, water, bread, wine, and the mouth of men in the kingdom of the right, people are able to reject God and his gospel. Likewise, since watchmen and pastors are just as sinful as anyone else, and likely more sinful, there are great temptations to neglect true doctrine, 
set aside Christ-like applications of the gospel, abuse authority, and harm the congregation. Once again, our theme is the Christian's life in the two kingdoms. In Christ's kingdom, the Christian lives under grace and continually has and receives the gifts of God, faith, adoption, unconditional love, peace with the Lord God Almighty, complete forgiveness, an heir of heaven, salvation, baptismal assurance, eternal life, the Lord's Supper, the communion of saints, and the sure and certain hope of the resurrection are but a few examples. While the Christian and Christ Church remain in this world, and while we abide under the gospel in the kingdom of the right, the law of God is not to be neglected. That brings us to the exception mentioned a few minutes ago. Man's law in the kingdom of the left is to be obeyed unless it conflicts with God's law. At such times, God's law is to be obeyed, even if it means suffering the consequences of breaking man's law in the kingdom of the left. One of the clearest examples of this takes place just after the sacrificial death of God the Son, the triumphant resurrection of Jesus the Christ, and the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The apostles began proclaiming this good news of Jesus the Christ and engaging in acts of mercy. The governing authorities told them to stop. They didn't. The law enforcement officials put them in prison. They were miraculously freed. A report was given. In the fifth chapter of Acts, the account continues. And someone came and told them, The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but without violence, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as ruler and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This naturally leads us into an area that has had disastrous consequences. It happens when one or the other of these two kingdoms extends itself over the other. When the kingdom of the left rules over the church, the gospel is eventually outlawed or lost among those people. It can be imposed from the outside as in the Roman Empire, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States of America. To be sure, there were Christians in all of those places at that time, but the state ruled over the church. There were also state churches like in Sweden where everyone was a Lutheran and yet there were few Christians because the gospel was deemed outdated and insignificant. The other situation is just as bad, surely even worse. It's where the kingdom of the right picks up the sword and rules over the kingdom of the left. When this happens, the world ends up with the Salem witch trials and their executions, the various inquisitions where the faithful are tortured to death, and when the Romanists sold and purchased forgiveness and entry into heaven. Whenever there was opposition, there were executions, martyred and bartered. I want to conclude shortly and give an opportunity for a few questions. Please bear with me and be patient. There needs to be a few comments about the Christian's life in the two kingdoms. It is in the Christian and in the local Christian congregation where these two kingdoms intersect. The reason for this intersection is the cross. The two kingdoms intersected there as Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, shed his blood so all sins of all people of all times could be forgiven. The kingdom of the left put him on the cross as the Jewish leaders sought his death, a Roman governor wanted to wash his hands of him, and a centurion-led group of soldiers carried out their orders. The kingdom of the right stood at the foot of the cross and beheld their Savior. Jesus prayed for the forgiveness of all as he was accomplishing it. Yet there is one more example that we may hear about and greatly benefit from. 
In your mind's eye, do you see one of the other men who was crucified with Jesus? He had committed a capital crime, been arrested, put on trial, found guilty, sentenced to death by crucifixion, and was being executed. The kingdom of the left was having its way with him, and rightly so. In the midst of that, he heard the word of God's grace in Christ. He repented of his sin and looked to Jesus for forgiveness and eternal life. The repentant criminal petitioned the Lord God, saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The Christ answered the man's prayer and proclaimed, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The man paid the price under the laws of the kingdom of the left. His body was disposed of in some fashion, and it now awaits the day of the resurrection of the dead. But the man himself, that is, his soul, has been with the Lord Jesus in paradise since the darkness of that late afternoon. He is in the kingdom of the right hand of God, with the one who declared that his kingdom was not of this world. Now, let's take a few questions. Question. You've not mentioned the family. Why? Answer. You're very observant, and I commend you for that. The reality is that there wasn't time to address that adequately. Let me just say that following the discussion of the two kingdoms, one is prepared to address the three estates, the church, the state, and the family. The first two are given by God and exist for the welfare and benefit of the family. Perhaps we'll have the opportunity to delve into this if there's another convocation. Question. If what you claim about these two kingdoms is true, then why is the pulpit so often used as a political megaphone? Answer. Your question has two parts to it. Both need to be addressed. The first reply is quick and simple. Not every Christian accepts the truth and existence of the two kingdoms. Hence, the degree of hostility from within the church. The second reply is an admission that Christian pulpits too often are used for political purposes, and they shouldn't be, as well as too often being accused of it when they aren't, and then being criticized when they don't. Now, that sounds complicated, but let's break it down. There is no place for politics in Christian pulpits, period. See, that was simple. Christ's pulpit at the Sand City Tower doesn't preach political partisanship and won't so long as I'm there, period. Let me address what may be going through minds here now and do so by an example. Imagine that there is a new law that is being proposed. If passed, this law would allow agents of the government to read all mail for security purposes. There will be some, even some Christians, who will heartily support that in order to protect our city and area. There will be others, even some Christians, who will vehemently oppose that because it is an invasion of privacy. This is a political issue. The preacher has no business sermonizing about it in terms of supporting or opposing it. There are no scriptural references that speak to the essence of this issue. We can pray that the leaders of the governing authorities would be courageous enough to exercise wisdom, justice, and temperance in this matter. But beyond that, the watchman needs to keep his mouth shut. It may have wrangled a few here when I said that I don't preach sermons on political issues. Some here may recall that there have been sermons opposing abortion or not succumbing to the redefining of marriage. That is true, but these are not political issues for the Christian church and for faithful watchmen. We are advocates for the unborn who can't speak for or defend themselves. These little ones, these unborn children, are our neighbors, and we are called to love them and intercede on their behalf. Nothing political in this at all. Likewise, the Christian church and her faithful pastors will be unrelenting in declaring that marriage is between one man and one woman. God has so created us and instituted marriage from the very beginning. In his word, God has so revealed to us what marriage is, and beyond that, nothing else is a marriage. The governing authorities may pass new laws declaring marriage to be something else, and impose fines for those who don't abide by man's law, but it's only man's law and not God's will. The Christian church, Christ's faithful under-shepherds, and the individual Christian will continue on as they are called to do. If there are consequences to suffer, so be it. 
It's nothing new. Excellent question. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to the issues involved. Is there another question? Question. When you spoke about the criminal on the cross, you said something about his body and soul. Could you explain that a bit more? Answer. What I meant to say was this. We're not bodies with souls, but rather we're souls with bodies. There is a book by George MacDonald where he wrote of this. I'm sorry, but I don't recall the name of it. It's a truth that flows from the scriptures. Thus, in many of our church record books, we list and count souls in the congregation rather than bodies or people. Compilers insert. Watchman Pintock was referring to George MacDonald's 1867 book titled Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. In that book, there is a dialogue between the vicar, or parson, who speaks in the first person, and one of his parishioners, old Mrs. Tompkins, who is dying and quite afraid. The compilers benefited from it, and perhaps it will be of help and comfort to others as well. The vicar begins with an inquiry. You believe in Jesus Christ, don't you, Mrs. Tompkins? That I do, sir, with all my heart and soul. Well, he says that whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall never die. But you know, sir, everybody dies. I must die and be laid in the churchyard, sir, and that's what I don't like. But I say that is all a mistake. You won't die. Your body will die and be laid away out of sight, but you will be awake, alive, more alive than you are now, a great deal. And here let me interrupt the conversation to remark upon the great mistake of teaching children that they have souls. The consequence is that they think of their souls as of something which is not themselves, for what a man has cannot be himself. Hence, when they are told that their souls go to heaven, they think of their selves as lying in the grave. They ought to be taught that they have bodies and that their bodies die while they themselves live on. Then they will not think, as old Mrs. Tompkins did, that they will be laid in the grave. It is making altogether too much of the body, and is indicative of an evil tendency to materialism, that we talk as if we possessed souls instead of being souls. We should teach our children to think no more of their bodies when dead than they do of their hair when it is cut off, or of their old clothes when they have done with them. Do you really think so, sir? Indeed I do. I don't know anything about where you will be, but you will be with God, in your father's house, you know. And that is enough, is it not? Yes, surely, sir. But I wish you was to be there by the bedside of me when I was a-dying. I can't help being something skeered at it. It don't come natural to me, like, like I got used to this old bed here, cold as it may be, many of the nights with my good man there beside me. Send for me, Mrs. Tompkins, any moment, day or night, and I'll be with you directly. End of compiler's insert. Question. How do you feel about being on the hit list? Answer. How do I feel about it? I suppose I feel as anyone would. Troubled, concerned, afraid. But really, I'd rather answer the question about what I think about it. Here's what I'm thinking right now. In the pastoral succession of watchmen yesterday, today, and tomorrow, I think about where I am today. I wonder where I might be tomorrow. Hundreds of years in the distant past, an old Roman priest said something that is sobering and thought-provoking. I expect to die in bed. My successor will die in prison, and his successor will die a martyr in the public square. His successor will pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization, as the church has done so often in human history. God knows where and how I will die. I don't. By the grace of the Father in sending His Son, by the person and work of Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through the means of grace, I will depart this life and be with Jesus in paradise. I pray that I and you may believe this good news, remain faithful unto death, and be given the crown of life. Revelation 2.10 Chapter 82 Alexandra and Zechariah Alexandra sat in a secluded alcove in the central courtyard and tried to sort out her thoughts and emotions. It seemed impossible. 
when she attempted to reason things out within her mind, her emotions kept muddling her thoughts. When she delved into the emotions of her heart, her mind kept interfering. Sitting and stewing didn't help. She decided that a vigorous walk on the perimeter path of Arete Park might help. It took three laps in two hours' time to settle herself and find a way to proceed. She sat once more and noticed the soothing sound of the fountain some distance away. An analysis by way of a timeline was the way Alexandra was going to proceed. Event to emotion to thought to analysis. The first event was meeting Zechariah by the fountain this morning. She was curious and anxious. She was also happy and thrilled to see him and be in his presence. Those were normal emotions and resulted in a natural reaction. She experienced that for many subsequent mornings. The analysis? She was in love with him and glad to be in his presence. Satisfied, she continued. After greeting one another with an extended hug and kiss, Zechariah said that he was going to explore the four corners today. She backed away from him slightly and told him it was too dangerous and he shouldn't do it. What were her reactions? Mainly fear for him for what he might have to endure. Fear for her, knowing he was going to be in danger. Normal emotions, normal reactions. The analysis? She was in love with him and was afraid for what might happen to him. Satisfied, she continued. Zechariah stated that he had to go. Exploring beyond the limits of what would be considered normal was one of the reasons he had been sent to Arete. She became angry and told him not to go. He said he was resolved in the matter, saying he was going and trying to reassure her that it would be okay. Her reaction was obvious, anger. But why? Because he wouldn't obey her? No. She feared that something might happen to him, if not physically, then mentally or spiritually. Would he be the same man when he returned from those dreadful places? She didn't know the answer to that and wanted to err on the side of caution. The analysis? She was in love with him. She was afraid for him and didn't want anything to happen to him. While she wasn't satisfied with this, Alexandra understood and moved on to what happened next. Event to emotion to thought to analysis. Zechariah became frustrated with her and left for the four dark corners contrary to her will and counsel. Alexandra was overwhelmed. Her emotions were a soup of shock, dread, anger, apprehension, fear, exasperation, care, and compassion as she watched him walk out of sight beyond the trees. Alexandra couldn't sort her feelings out. Any attempts at thinking things through from various viewpoints were far from her. Analysis? There was nothing to work with. The required prerequisites had not been completed. Nor could Alexandra restrain the fountain of her tears. When her eyes cleared enough, she began a slow walk on the perimeter path once again. About halfway around, she realized she might not be there when Zechariah returned. She didn't want to miss him, and she jogged back to the fountain area. The vigorous activity helped clear her mind. Alexandra prayed a few psalms with supplications and petitions on behalf of herself and Zechariah. After a moment of further meditation, she retrieved her copy of Sacred Meditations from her pack. She paged through Johann Gerhardt's 1606 work until she came to Meditation 25, which concerned prayer. She read it and returned to one section and reread it again and again. Prayer is pleasing to God, but only when offered in His appointed way. If, therefore, thou wouldst be heard in prayer, pray wisely, ardently, humbly, faithfully, perseveringly, and confidently. Pray wisely, that is, for those things that may be for the glory of God and the salvation of thy fellow men. Alexandra paused and looked up to see if Zechariah was coming. He was not. She prayed that he would return to her. She continued her reading and application of it. God is almighty. Do not strive, therefore, in thy prayer to limit or restrict his power. He is all-wise. Do not, then, prescribe any set order in which thy prayer should be answered. 
Be not rash or presumptuous in thy prayers, but let them issue from a heart full of faith. Faith, however, hath due regard to the divine word. What God promises absolutely in his word, that thou mayest pray for absolutely. What he promises conditionally, as, for example, temporal blessings, those likewise thou shouldst ask for conditionally. What he has in no way promised, thou shouldst in no way pray for. She understood that God didn't absolutely promise a loved one would return from a war in a faraway land, or from a stroll in Arete. No matter how long, or how hard, or how many times he prayed, a father wasn't promised that his military son was going to return to him. The same was true for Alexandra's petitions on behalf of Zechariah. She prayed, Thy will be done. She lifted her eyes in the direction of Zechariah's expected return and didn't see him. She prayed the same prayer to the Lord her God. After finishing with this devotion on the saving efficacy of prayer, she read the next one on guardian angels, praying that Zechariah's angel would watch over and protect him. Consider, O devout soul, the grace of thy God in sending his angel's charge concerning thee. Our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world to deliver us from our sins. The Son of God himself became incarnate for our salvation. The Holy Spirit is sent to sanctify us. Angels are dispatched from heaven to protect us. Thus, the whole assembly of heaven is employed to serve us and to make their blessings ours. I no longer wonder that all the inferior creatures of earth are formed for man, since even the angels of heaven, so much more exalted than we, deny us not their gentle ministries. Zechariah bent down and kissed Alexandra softly on the cheek. He whispered, There is no doubt in my mind that you have oil in your lamp. Huh? she said. Oh, I'm sorry, I fell asleep. I was waiting for you. I want you to forgive me. I was wrong. Nothing to forgive. You were right. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Still not completely awake and alert, she mumbled, Sure. Are you all right? Yes, but first things first. Please forgive me. I forgive you in the name of Jesus. He spoke his reply, Thank you, and thank you. Alexandra asked him, What happened? You okay? Please, I want to know. Tell me. I'm fine, but I want you to understand that it was important for me to explore them, and yet keep my distance. I perceive that the devil is very much at home in such places. Satan is staked out in those corners and wanders with a limited length of divine chain. If one dares to step into his spheres of influence, he will readily accommodate. He operates through means, and one of those means is the isolated virtue. What Chesterton wrote is so very true. The virtues have gone mad because they have been isolated from each other and are wandering alone. I had to learn of this not only from an academic perspective, but also from an experiential one, but that only to a certain point. And that was my greatest fear. Zechariah said, Please, tell me what you mean. She replied as requested, The setting is the same as the Garden of Eden. The devil beholds Eve, and the temptation is to be like God, knowing good and evil. God didn't have to experience it to know it. Adam and Eve came to know good and evil by experiencing it. Now, I'm fine, but you're correct. Those corners are horrible, dangerous places. But I resolved to keep my distance, and I must confess that God used you to keep me from delving too deeply. You kept pulling at me. I wanted to finish what I needed to know and return to you as soon as possible. That was an answer to my prayers, she confessed. Tell me what you learned. Okay, Zechariah replied. Here's a summation of what I've come up with so far. It's neither complete nor comprehensive, rather simplistic, actually. Wisdom guides. Justice governs. Temperance encourages. Courage engages. He continued, Each of these virtues is essentially passive, and they are subsequently expressed in words and or deeds. Each virtue is capable of being cultivated in one way or another. For example, wisdom by learning, perspective, common sense, and life experiences. Justice by reading, history, analyzing, and sacrificial service. 
temperance by listening, bird's eye viewing, weighing, and past case studies, and courage by trials, suffering, enduring, and confronting fear. Alexandra said nothing and waited. Also, he said, it's not how much of a virtue one has, but how the four virtues are balanced in the individual. That balance is going to differ from person to person, for we are all different. Right brain, left brain stuff, personality, interests, background, vocation, the list continues. At the same time, this isn't some self-evaluation process or navel-gazing exercise. In fact, any evaluations are best made by others. For example, King Saul needed someone to help him when oppressed by a dark spirit. A servant recommended a young man named David, or, as it is written, So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well, and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. 1 Samuel 16, verses 17 and 18. David was qualified in outward abilities and inward balanced virtues. What did you discover about those isolated corners? Zechariah replied, I didn't want to approach so close as to be drawn in by coercion, persuasion, trickery, or enticement. So I only have obscure impressions, vague suggestions, hazy hints about what lay in wait in those dreadful places. Here's a list of what I have written in my journal. Wisdom alone equals sterile and anemic academia. Courage alone equals ruthless and salivating barbarians. Temperance alone equals atrophied and dithering cowards. Justice alone, the god of the sandmen. I also stumbled on a couple of points where two virtues intersected, where two virtues are present but the other two aren't. The two that are present are warped because of the imbalance. I imagine that there are a couple dozen places located on the perimeter, but I have no interest in finding out more. Here are the conclusions of the two points I did locate. Justice and temperance equals ascetic monasticism. Justice and courage equals corrupt power. Alexandra said, You have much to ponder in our studies and assessments. How do you propose we proceed? Propose? Did you say propose? How do you intend to proceed with our studies? That's what I mean. Oh, responded Zechariah with feigned despondency. I guess it would have to be in the application and integration of the Z-axis virtues, the Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love. I hope to pursue love. Are you interested in remaining my guide in this? Would that be academic or experiential? Yes, he answered. Alexandra smiled and asked, Earlier when you woke me, I was too groggy. Did you say something about oil? Zechariah chuckled. <laughs> yes, I noted that you had faith in your lamp as you awaited my advent. Alexandra smiled and asked, And are you the bridegroom that I was waiting for? He said in a most serious and somewhat anxious manner, I am only able to be your bridegroom if you agree to be my bride. I agree. Zechariah continued earnestly, No, what I mean is this, will you marry me? Alexandra smiled and replied with a simple, Yes. The joy and exhilaration Zechariah felt can't be adequately recorded in words. They embraced each other and kissed amidst laughter and bliss. Zechariah, my beloved, this is a wonderful time of joy and celebration. I want everyone to know about this. Will you take me to the theater this evening? Yes. But wait, you don't know what is being presented. You might not want to go. We could go somewhere else. No, I want to go to the theater. I don't really care about what's happening there anyway. I'll be with you, and I doubt I'll hear one line. Alexandra said, Well, let's hurry back. I want to get cleaned up and ready. We'll meet at the court outside the amphitheater about 15 minutes before the performance begins. He replied, That sounds like a plan. Do we want to reserve a table and bring a few snacks? Probably not, unless you want to. It's not going to be a lengthy performance. The dean is reading... The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. Really? The Dean? Yes, 
he and the poem were requested by popular demand. A few hours later, they met in front of the amphitheater. It was only a couple minutes before the recitation was to begin. Alexandra was truly elegant, and Zechariah was stunned by her beauty. She was casually dressed in soft blue capri pants and a three-quarter length sleeve blouse. Her hair was up and gathered into a pure white snood with white pearls. He was overjoyed to be in her presence once again. He kissed her, and they embraced. As they did, she whispered in his ear, Soap and cinnamon. He laughed and replied, You elevate their status. Quickly, she said, we must get inside. I think it's about to begin. Arm in arm, they entered the amphitheater and sought a place to sit near the back. Others around them smiled, greeting them with words of congratulations. Zechariah didn't understand how they knew this. The dean stepped forward, and the applause began. Zechariah was confused, for everyone was standing and facing in their direction. There were cheers and shouts. Even the dean was smiling and clapping. Zechariah blushed, and Alexandra glowed. He leaned to her and asked, How did they know? She waved to the audience and answered him, It's the white snood, and besides, it's not like this is unexpected. Everyone has been waiting for this. Finally, the applause and cheering subsided. The audience seated itself and directed its attention to the dean. While they were done, the dean wasn't. He asked, So, how am I going to compete with that? The amphitheater erupted in laughter. Zeke! Please escort your beloved down here to the front. There's a place right here. He then appealed to the crowd. We want Zeke to bring Alexandra down here, don't we? The chanting began, Zeke, Zeke, Zeke. When the two lovers arose and Zechariah escorted Alexandra down to the front, the chanting gave way to applause and cheers. Mary! <laughs> As they continued to smile, they turned and waved to the crowd. Finally, they sat and looked to the dean, waiting for him to begin the performance. The dean wasn't quite ready. He said, The second part of the performance is the hound from heaven, and we'll begin in a few minutes. We've all enjoyed the first part, which might be entitled, The Hound from the Tunnels. Laughter erupted once again. <laughs> The dean began a few minutes later. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind and in the midst of tears. Neither Zechariah nor Alexandra heard any of the poem. Chapter 83 The Supreme Ruler Field General Musa truly feared no man. His mental focus physical toughness, determined will, religious devotion to the Sandman God, and lack of desire for anything political placed him as the perfect man in charge of on-the-ground military operations. General Musa had been consistently promoted from his entry-level, non-commissioned officer rank to his present station. He was given nothing based upon family, for he had none, or political cronyism, for he had neither friends nor governmental contacts. He simply and astutely carried out his assignments with tactical ingenuity that impressed the military echelon above him and battlefield awareness that won the support and devotion of those serving under his command. The career soldier preferred bivouacking, not as a temporary living condition, but one of permanent residences. Consequently, his summons to the living quarters of the supreme ruler placed him in a foreign environment. It is likely that Field General Musa was one of two people in the San Men nation who didn't fear the supreme ruler as he stood beside him on the royal balcony. The supreme ruler gazed at the surroundings and asked, It is a beautiful morning, is it not? General Musa perceived that even this wasn't an innocuous query. The verbal sparring had begun, and both men were aware of it. The general had known many supreme rulers in his long life of service. Some were religious zealots who didn't have a clue about any other aspect of life. These men raised religious fervor by directing vile edicts against the polytheists to the north. 
Others were simply politicians who focused on staying in power and were only concerned about threats from within the governmental arena. General Musa couldn't recall any of them having anything other than a superficial knowledge of military campaigns or capabilities. The supreme ruler to his left was an exception. He was a politically motivated, religious zealot, and a faithfully ardent, power-wielding political leader. While he wasn't any more experienced in military affairs than any of his predecessors, he had something that none of the others didn't. Namely, he was aware of his inexperience and lack of tactical military knowledge. Add to this the recent demonstrations of his willingness to execute those who didn't follow his edicts or who weren't willing to sacrifice themselves in his service, and this made him the most dangerous man that General Musa ever knew. Indeed, was the general's reply. The supreme ruler didn't speak for a moment as he thought about what Musa's response might mean. Did he agree that it was a beautiful day here, or beyond the horizon where both were looking? Or maybe it was a beautiful day somewhere else, which he supposed was always true. Or did the general mean that it wasn't a beautiful day at all? Maybe it was just an answer to the supreme ruler's final question of, Is it not? Thus, indeed, it is not. General, if one were to wage a military campaign against the infidels to the north, how would you suggest it be done? One would need to know the chief commander's immediate goal and overall mission. It might be advantageous to future operations to know the ultimate goal, but that is not absolutely necessary. The supreme ruler turned his head and fixed his eyes on Musa, who remained gazing into the distance. Musa was then asked, And what is the difference between the immediate goal and the overall mission? Musa answered without hesitation, The immediate goal is what one wants. The mission is how to accomplish it. And why would you be hesitant about having knowledge of the ultimate goal? Sir, with all due respect, the ultimate goal may rest outside the military's area of operations. Nonetheless, it may be of advantage in terms of seamless progression from immediate goal to the next step toward ultimate goal to divulge that information. However, whether one does that or not is the decision of the leader put together a proposal that would, at the minimum, be a disruption of the North City Alliance, and at a maximum could evolve into a full invasion and conquering of the infidel cities and lands to the north. General Musa looked at his commander and stated, Already done. Do you desire that I inform you of it, or would you prefer that it be implemented at your word? General, I asked you how you would suggest a war be waged against the infidels to the north. Was I unclear? Quite clear. As long as you don't want deniability, I will answer your question in detail. The supreme leader fumed and railed at Musa. And other than you, who would be aware of my knowledge or lack of knowledge? No one, Musa answered calmly and continued. I simply have no desire to presume one way or the other. Tell me what you would recommend, the supreme ruler ordered in an enunciated hiss. General Musa declared, Five thousand troops would assemble to the west. Supply lines and logistical supports between our depots and the forward camps would be established and put into service. Scouts tasked with reconnaissance assignments would be deployed through the swamplands and to the north. Mustering points would be established. All of this is to be done within three days. Then our military would explode into the land between Arete and Sand City, destroying everyone and everything. We divide the infidels, occupy the land, and proceed with the actual invasion. And would you make that final invasion of and push into the north without my orders? Musa answered in a calm demeanor. As requested, my recommendation is to receive your order to attack before we enter the marshlands. Once given, we will not be stopping. Truly, no messenger from you would be able to catch up with us. We don't want to lose the element of surprise. We strike fast and hard. Of course, if you want it done another way, I'm here to receive and carry out your orders. The Supreme Ruler said, Make preparations and await my order to proceed. Tell no one about this. If anyone asks about the build-up, tell them it is nothing more than a military exercise in order to defend against an attack from the north. General Musa replied, Yes, understood, Supreme Leader. He saluted and started to leave. One more thing, General. Certainly. 
One of our moles in the north uh, reported that a cell member ordered her to come up with a hit list of Sandman targets. The cell member is responsible for the deaths of too many of our people, especially those in a former cell. If possible, he is to be captured and interrogated. Anyway, a list was made and given to the man. We are using it to set a trap for this renegade cell member, a man named Cavan at birth, but he now calls himself James Baylor. I took the liberty of adding your name to the hit list. I hope you don't mind. Musa replied, Not at all, Supreme Leader. It's an honor to be a part of this devil's demise. General, you are dismissed. Musa saluted and left. As he did, he pondered his dismissal. From an upper story window several hundred yards away, James observed the meeting of the Supreme Ruler and General Musa. With the monocular stolen from a museum near the university, James was able to watch them. He wished that he could read lips better, but was satisfied with the conversation's drift. He wasn't able to catch any of the last part because the Supreme Ruler's back was to him. He did perceive the words, Devil and Demise, from the mouth of General Musa. James returned the monocular to its case. He took out the hit list and put a check mark behind the general's name. After the last name on the list, he added a new entry, Supreme Ruler. Chapter 84 Watchman Micaiah the Second. Alexandra and Zechariah walked hand in hand past the fountain, through the forested city park, and on to the Arete Tower. It was a familiar path, for they had taken it many times for morn song and even song. He asked her what she thought about this quotation from Plato's Apology of Socrates. If, then, those among you who appear to excel, either in wisdom or fortitude or any other virtue whatsoever, should act in such a manner as I have often seen some, when they have been brought to trial, it would be shameful, who, appearing indeed to be something, have conducted themselves in a surprising manner, as thinking they should suffer something dreadful by dying, and as if they would be immortal if you did not put them to death. Alexandra said, The consideration of this quote in the context of the entire work seems especially important. Can we take a look at the original work later? Sure, he said, as they joined the faithful who gathered. During the dismissal from Mornsong, watchman Micaiah II asked to speak with them. He requested they return in several hours for a meeting and apologized for the lack of lead time. Their return to the tower at this late morning hour was in anticipation of speaking with the watchman about their wedding, specifically the date and details concerning it. Watchman Micaiah II welcomed them at the door, hugging Alexandra and shaking Zechariah's hand. While the watchman was gracious in his greeting and genuine in his welcome, Zechariah thought he noticed a preoccupation. The watchman's smile seemed slightly forced as he invited them into his study. Zechariah and Alexandra were both surprised to see the dean seated. She said, Are we too early? We don't want to interrupt your meeting or study. No, watchman Micaiah II said. I've asked dean to be here. Please sit down. May I get you something to drink? Both indicated that they were fine. He continued, First, I know I've done so in passing, but I want to offer my sincere congratulations on your engagement and for your upcoming wedding. I am overjoyed, and pray God's blessings upon you. Tell me when the wonderful event may be. Zechariah nudged Alexandra, and she answered, We were hoping that it would be this fall, although we haven't picked a specific day. Ah, was the watchman's response. It did not escape Zechariah's notice that Dean hadn't reacted in any way to their presence or discussion. He looked at Dean and asked Micaiah II, Is there a problem with that? The watchman thought a moment and then replied, No, that's actually a better date. It gives us enough time to accomplish what needs to be done. But I get ahead of myself. Let, let me explain. Zechariah and Alexandra looked with apprehension that comes from not knowing what might follow. In the past, we've had a primitive way of remaining in contact with Sand City. It was through a series of manned lookouts from which basic signals could be given. Essentially, there were two messages, everything is fine, and there is trouble. The lookouts have been improved over time. However, communication was still very basic. When Dean arrived here, he came with the code that enables us to receive and send complete messages. 
The young couple gazed at Dean. He remained subdued. Micaiah continued, We're now able to get a message from North Tower area to us here in Arete in 10 to 12 hours, with the longest period of time being in the tunnels. Dean added, That's with Polite running the tunnels. The watchman continued, The messaging system has been in operation for a couple months now, and it's of great benefit to everyone. The three said nothing, and the watchman continued, This morning... Watchman Pintock at Sand City Tower received a message that originated from the North Tower. He had that communication relayed to us shortly after Mornsong yesterday. Watchman Thomas has been called from this veil of tears to the Lord our God in heaven. He is now with Christ and free from all the pain, sorrow, suffering, hurt, and anguish. Dean said, Thanks be to God. Alexander said, Yes, as Zechariah said, Amen. Just before Mornsong today, another message was received. The lady has called you, Zechariah, to be the watchman at the North Tower. Dean repeated, Thanks be to God. Alexandra squeezed her fiancé's arm and smiled. That's such an honor for you and a blessing for the church. Zechariah was speechless as he pondered what this meant. Finally he prayed, Thy will be done, dear Father in heaven. After a moment he added, Is there a plan? Watchman Micaiah answered, First, you're to consider this call and decide whether or not to accept it. Sadly, you won't have much time to consider it. The church must have your answer by tomorrow at this time. Zechariah asked, Why so soon? Dean weighed in. There are reports of Sandman troops moving away from their posts. Travelers from their lands tell of a quietness and tenseness existing among the people in the southern lands. We have less time than we imagine. I sense it in my bones and I'm uneasy. While feelings aren't the basis for my actions, I've come to know that they aren't to be rejected without consideration. Here's the proposal, offered Watchman Micaiah II. Listen and think about it. First, with the wedding so many months away, we have some flexibility here. Alexandra, I've spoken with the city manager, and, if it meets your approval, we'd like you to get educated in the signal codes and be in charge of communications between the outposts and Watchman Pintock and the Sand City Tower. You'll be sending and receiving communications, some of them classified. In addition, you'll need to be training people to take over for you after your wedding. Is this something you'd consider taking on? Alexandra gazed upon the watchman with a certain hint of skepticism. She said, I'll consider it. However, it's not prudent for me to decide until I hear the rest of your proposal. Dean responded, Wisdom and temperance. The watchman continued, if Zechariah accepts the call, then he and Dean leave immediately for Sand City. There they meet with Watchman Pintock, and all three will proceed to the North Tower, where Zechariah is ordained and installed. Zechariah begins his duties immediately. Watchman Pintock returns to the Sand City Tower. Dean is flexible and would return here. Zechariah will return at some point for the wedding. Zechariah sensed Alexandra's uneasiness and frustration. He looked at her and asked, would you care to respond? She said, Please, go ahead. You have something on your mind. I want to hear it. Perhaps I won't need to voice my concerns. Zechariah replied, If I were Alexandra, I'd have a few questions in need of answering. How is anyone going to return to Arete with the keeper preventing anyone from entering? I don't think what we did last time will work again. Furthermore, why isn't the city manager here, and why is watchman Micaiah II making all these proposals? But I believe I will leave the most pressing question for Alexandra to ask. All right, said the watchman. Before you ask Alexandra, let me answer those questions. The city manager asked me to take care of these matters. I agreed to do so with two conditions. First, Dean had to be in attendance. His experience and knowledge are vital. And second, everything decided had to be with you two approving the course of action. That's why we began with it being a proposed plan. It's not my plan, but a plan that may or may not be our plan. My responsibility is to run this meeting, gain the approvals needed for the plan, and lead in its implementation. As of an hour ago, the keeper and his thugs are no longer at the bridge. The city manager led a group of law enforcement officers to secure the bridge and send the keeper and the others away. It was long overdue, as was the opening of Arete to visitors. Please, Alexandra. She asked, 
How is my assignment not simply busy work intended to keep me from going with Zechariah now? It's not. The work we have for you is critical. If you don't choose to do it, we have to know that immediately. Someone else will be selected and asked to do it. Communicating with others in the region must have our highest priority now. We need to be able to plan, coordinate, and execute matters for the benefit of all people here in the northern lands. It seems to me, Alexandra, there are two issues involved here. Whether or not you want to help with the communication should be answered quickly. However, of primary importance is your answer to this question. Ought you wait here in Arete until Zechariah returns in five or six months, or should you leave with him now? Dean struggled to maintain his silence. Alexandra asked the watchman, May Zechariah and I step outside and speak for a few minutes? Certainly. They left. Dean asked the watchman for paper so he could write down a list of needed supplies. Watchman Micaiah II handed him a sheet of paper that had something written on one side. Dean read it. From the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Ah, you philosophize, replied Villefort, after a moment's silence, during which, like a wrestler who encounters a powerful opponent, he took a breath. Well, sir, really, if you like, I had nothing else to do, I should seek a more amusing occupation. Why, in truth, sir, was Monte Cristo's reply, man is but an ugly caterpillar for him who studies him through a solar microscope. But you said, I think, that I had nothing else to do. Now, really, let me ask, sir, have you? Do you believe you have anything to do? Or, to speak in plain terms, do you really think that what you do deserves to be called anything? Villefort's astonishment redoubled at this second thrust, so forcibly made by his strange adversary. It was a long time since the magistrate had heard a paradox so strong, or rather, to say the truth more exactly, it was the first time he had ever heard it. The public prosecutor exerted himself to reply. Sir, he responded, you are a stranger, and I believe you say that a portion of your life has been spent in oriental countries. Thus, then, you are not aware how human justice, so expeditious in barbarous countries, takes with us a prudent and well-studied course. Oh, yes, yes I do, sir. It is the limping foot of the ancients. I know all that for it is with the justice of all countries, especially that I have occupied myself. It is with the criminal procedure of all nations that I have compared natural justice, and I must say, sir, that it is the law of primitive nations, that is, the law of retaliation, that I have most frequently found to be according to the law of God. Meanwhile, watchman Micaiah II sat with his eyes down looking at a passage of Scripture. He combined the reading of the Word of God with the intercessory prayers for others. On this occasion, he prayed the 23rd Psalm with Zechariah in mind. O Lord my God, I thank and praise you for bringing Zechariah into the fold of Christianity and granting that Jesus is his shepherd. Truly with you as his Father, your Son as his Savior, and the Holy Spirit as the giver of gifts and sustainer of faith, Zechariah shall not want. You shall provide him with whatever you deem good for him, for his loved ones, and for his church. Dear Jesus, continue to let Zechariah recline in the green pastures of your grace, mercy, and peace, where he may grow and abide. You have led him to the still waters of baptism. Continue to lead him there each day, so that the old Adam in him may be daily drowned, and a new man come forth as he is restored. I ask that you continue to lead Zechariah in the paths of righteousness, in the ways of word and sacrament, that bestow your pristine righteousness upon him. Grant that he not seek to replace your perfect righteousness that comes by grace through faith in you with any other righteousness, for that would only lead to cursedness and destruction. Do this, O Lord, for your name's sake. Your name is Jesus, and your name is Savior. I beseech you, be Zechariah's Savior. Continue to be his Jesus. And even though he walks through the valley of the shadow of death, Grant him the Holy Spirit and his gift of faith, so that Zechariah fears no evil. Remind and assure him that you are the good shepherd who is with him, that your rod and staff comfort him. You prepare a table before Zechariah even in the presence of his enemies. You are with him always, even to the end of the age. You anoint his head with oil, declaring him to be your own. His cup overflows, for your forgiveness is greater than his sins. 
which have been removed from him as far as the east is from the west. Surely with you as his shepherd, goodness and mercy shall follow Zechariah all the days of his life, and he shall dwell in your house, O Lord, for ever and ever. May this be so for Zechariah, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The watchman paused for reflection and then continued, O Lord my God, all thanks and praise belong to you for bringing Alexandra into the fold of Christianity and granting that Jesus is her shepherd. At that moment the young couple returned. Alexandra sat while Zechariah stood beside her with one hand on her shoulder. She looked at Dean and asked, Do you have any concerns with the plan that Watchman Micaiah II has proposed? Yes, I'm concerned if you two separate now. We'll have a difficult time getting you reunited later. At the same time, traveling across these lands with both of you could easily be tragic. The latter concerns me more than the former. She continued, Aren't you also concerned about us making a decision based upon what our hearts are feeling versus what our heads are thinking? Dean replied, No, not at all. The fact of your asking me this question reinforces my belief. I trust your judgment and will respect your decision, as well as do what I can to carry out the tasks that I am called to undertake. Alexandra turned her head to speak with Zechariah. He leaned his ear down and listened. After a moment he straightened and said, as painful as it is for us, we've decided to proceed with the watchman's plan. Dean breathed a sigh of relief. Smiling, Zechariah continued, I know if Dean were asked when we should go, he'd say something like, an hour ago, or before sundown, but we leave tomorrow, before dawn. That way neither of you, or anyone else, will be able to see our tears. If you approve, Alexandra and I will have lunch together now. Then she will begin working on the communication codes and how the system works. I will assemble the gear I need and put it in my pack. It won't be much. I travel light. Dean interjected, Extra water canteen! Zechariah nodded and finished. Later today, Alexandra and I will have supper together and talk some more. We ask you to please advise and counsel us if our thinking is wrong or if we need to revise our plans. Dean said nothing. Watchman Micaiah II nodded and stated, May God grant all of us, but especially you two, his faith, strength, discernment, power, love, and Holy Spirit to accomplish his plan in your life and in your lives. The next day, an hour before dawn, all four met at the fountain. Together they made their way to the city entrance and the end of the bridge. Their walk was a silent one except for the periodic sniffing from the softly weeping Alexandra. Her fiancé refused to sniff, opting instead for the sleeve of his shirt. Tears flowed from the young lover's eyes. They welled up in the watchman's eyes. Dean looked ahead and pondered what the future held. Watchman Micaiah II said, There is darkness now, but the light is coming. The Father has created you and brought you this far. The Son has redeemed you and brought you this far. The Holy Spirit has wrought the gift of faith within you and brought you this far. God has already done so much for you. Surely there is hope for what is ahead. May the Lord our God grant that your hopes and desires be His will and that He accomplishes them. The Lord be with you. Zechariah and Dean replied together, And, and with, with thy, thy spirit. spirit. The two lovers embraced and kissed. She said, Love you. Please be careful. He said, And I love you. One way or the other, I'll see you later or sooner. I pray sooner. She replied, Me too. They parted. Zechariah and Dean shouldered their small packs and silently walked slowly across the bridge. They passed the Arete guards on the far side. Through teary eyes, Alexandra watched them disappear into the darkness as the morning star appeared in the eastern sky. She thought of her Jesus and his most recent messenger. Dean saw the morning star as well. He pointed it out to Zechariah and said, It is written in Revelation 22.16, I, Jesus, have sent my messenger to testify these things to you in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. May you, as one of his messengers, as one of his angels, bear witness in the church to Jesus and his gospel. Zechariah said nothing, but he did ponder all these things in his heart. Chapter 85 Ibrahim the morning report was given around the breakfast table. 
Old Ibrahim was the patriarch and head of his family. His wife was named Lily, after the water plants in the festival garden. Grandma Lily moved pancakes from the griddle to the individual plates where they were eaten immediately. The rest of the family was made up of three sons, two daughters, two daughters-in-law, one son-in-law, and nine grandchildren. They ran out of pancakes before the hungry stomachs were completely satisfied. Nonetheless, each had enough. As they finished, Ibrahim recited Psalm 119 from memory. The grandchildren listened intently, knowing that they would be memorizing all 176 verses of it, eight verses for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. When he finished, Grandma Lily recited the last chapter in the book of Ruth. This was the fourth morning that she had done this, and the book was now complete. She noted that Ruth was the grandmother of King David, and how wonderful it was that this foreign woman was one of the ancestors of Jesus. Everyone was allowed sections of the scriptures to commit to memory and recite. The grandchildren recited every morning, and it was not always something that they were currently working on. Grandfather might ask for specific verses that were memorized months or even years ago. The youngest boy was named Deuteronomus, but they called him Dude. Grandpa Ibrahim asked, Dude, what are you memorizing? Deuteronomus answered, Grandfather, I have finished the Lord's Prayer and am working on Psalm 121. Ibrahim said, Good, now recite the 23rd Psalm. Deuteronomus did as he was told. Well done, dude. You remembered it. That's a psalm you might recite to yourself as you recline upon your deathbed. Grandma Lily interjected in a partly serious, mostly humorous scold, Ibrahim, don't frighten the boy. Ibrahim was going to reply, but Deuteronomus beat him to it. Ah, don't worry, Grandma. If I don't remember it at the time, I'll just make my grandson recite it for me. The whole family laughed. The oldest granddaughter, Jewel, announced that she had memorized the first three chapters of the Gospel of John. The old man asked her, What is the other translation for born again in John 3, verse 3? Jewel answered, Born from above. Correct. The rest of the children and grandchildren stated what they had memorized and what they were planning. Grandma Lily fed the house dogs with table scraps. She dropped the morsels to the floor and told everyone to get busy. One of her sons asked if she was only referring to the dogs or if the others were included. She gave him the eye as she handed lunches to those who would be going to work far from home. Ibrahim reminded everyone to remain silent to strangers and that he would be making a trip into the city in three days with a load of goods. It would be a three-day trip and he'd be taking one of his grandsons. He didn't indicate which one, and that served as motivation for them to be busy in mind and body. The girls knew better than to complain. They had been taught the dangers that awaited older girls and younger women who ventured into the wrong areas. The marriages of Ibrahim and Lily's children, both sons and daughters, had been arranged. They had chosen well, and all were blessed. Grandfather Ibrahim instructed them all to listen and invited those who could to join him in the recitation of Second Thessalonians 3. All did the first, half did the second. The youngest listened for familiar parts of the epistle and quickly joined in where and when they were able. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord, touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother who walks disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. 
Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. They all added the Amen at the end. One of the younger children asked, What does establish mean? The child's father answered, It's the same as establish, just an old way of saying it. Ibrahim rose and said, Let's be about our work. As we are, let's do what the Apostle Paul asked for in the first part of this chapter. Pray that the word of God may go forth and accomplish the peaceful purpose intended. Also, and especially, pray for those who have been entrusted with it, those men who are called servants of the word, that they may remain steadfast in the word and be faithful this day and at the end. Dude responded, Will do, Grandpa. They all laughed and went to work. Chapter 86, Dean and Zechariah Dean whispered the response of Marcellus in the first act of Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, saying it softly, as if only to himself, Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Zechariah replied with hushed words as he continued to follow Dean. What is it? Do you detect something wrong, or at least not right? Dean quickly moved his hand back and motioned Zechariah to stop and remain quiet. He'd been uneasy since leaving Arete, and his anxiety increased as they continued to walk. Had he been asked, he wouldn't have been able to specify the source, that indistinct haze on the distant horizon, the low-frequency vibrations in the earth, a hint of a smell in the afternoon air currents, the failure to hear anything normal, good or right, a systemic disharmony from within him. Dean couldn't rule out any or even all of these as the catalyst for his unsettled state. He spoke softly. Be still. Do you sense anything? Zechariah admitted. Nothing, save my wretchedly troubled spirit and your continuing restlessness. Dean looked at the young man and nodded, saying in a hushed voice, You and I know the source and reason for your troubled spirit. Neither of us can address what is causing me to be so unsettled. I'm bordering on what must be a panic attack. In order not to succumb to one, I'm exercising my will and appealing to my Lord and to my reason as never before. Zechariah surveyed the distance in all directions and said, I don't see anything, so don't try to identify the source or what it is that is troubling you. Rather, answer me this. What are you expecting or what do you expect to happen that could be of such magnitude as to cause your anxiety? Are you like the beast sensing an impending earthquake? No, I mean, yes, I'm a beast, but I'm not sensing an earthquake or any other occurrence of nature. If that's not anything like that, what is it that comes to mind? Dean closed his eyes, tilted his head, and inhaled. After a minute, he sighed a determined answer. An invasion. Zechariah eyed the landscape and replied with a quiet yet emphatic, What? An invasion. It's the only thing that could cause such a reaction within me, unless I'm going mental. That would be better for all, and thus I'd prefer it. Unfortunately, I believe that I'm not out of my mind. Zechariah, I'm expecting an imminent invasion by the Sandmen. All right, said the younger man. Then it's incumbent upon us to identify what we know, name the contingencies, state our long-term plan, and develop a short-term one. Dean looked at him and said, True, very true, thank you. I needed to get my bearings and begin to do something other than react to my feelings. Our mission is to get you to the North Tower. That may change, but it hasn't yet. We need intelligence and reports. We can get some of that at the Two Sisters' place. Travelers come and go, so will the reports. Some may be gossip, speculation, and so forth. Our job is to sift that all out and put together a situation report. However, and I'm asking and not dictating here, Instead of heading directly to the southeast and the two sisters' place, let's travel more to the east. 
Zechariah asked, Why do that? Because we might be able to get a line of sight on one of the communication lookouts. Maybe we'll find out if anything has happened in the last seven hours. I like that idea. Then we'll head straight south to the two sisters' place. Yes. How's your water supply? I'm down half a canteen. Okay. We should have enough for the diversion to the point where we can see the lookout, and then get to the two sisters' place. Let's move. Eat something on the way. We don't have time to stop. Zechariah's thoughts returned to Alexandra, but didn't remain with her for long. The physical and mental demands of their forced march, as well as the continued surveillance of the landscape, occupied his mind. Dean watched for the lookout and a place to observe the communication. In mid-afternoon, they saw the lookout, but they were not able to see it at an angle where they could make out the communication signals. An hour later, they were at an ideal location. They rested, drank water, and ate some of their food as they waited for the next update. In less than an hour, Zechariah saw some of the signals. He alerted Dean. The old man quickly said, I can see that far. You tell me the signal and I'll translate it into words. Zechariah nodded his agreement even as he began to relay what he saw. Dean wrote down what was being sent and sighed in frustration. Oh, the message from Arete to San City Tower is this. No change from the previous report. V-D-M-A. How do you know it's from Arete and not San City? Because of the attached 1 Peter 125 reference in the Latin translation of the scriptures, Verbum autum domini manet in eterum. The word of the Lord endures forever. V-D-M-A is the sign-off for Arete. S-D-G, soli deo gloria. Glory to God alone is the one for San City. The message is that there is no change at Arete? Dean answered, Yes, but that doesn't tell us anything. Something may have happened in or at Arete. Depending on what has happened in the last seven hours, it could be a continuing good situation or a bad condition. Dean said, We must now hurry south and find out what's being reported at the two sisters' place. Understood, replied Zechariah. I'm ready. Let's go. Some five hours later, they crested a hill that gave them a view of their destination. Immediately, the updraft carried the smoke to their nostrils. They smelled the smoldering remnants of what had so recently been the two sisters' place. Dean and Zechariah waited and saw no one. They descended the hill and approached their destination slowly and cautiously. All buildings had been torched, and there remained nothing but hot pockets of burning foundations of wood. Ash pits released wisps of smoke that curled in their ascension. While the entire complex had been destroyed, there appeared to be no one left, either dead or alive, either friend or foe. Zechariah prayed, Lord, have mercy on them. Dean added, Amen. Do you think they had some warning and got away? It's hard to tell. Let's take a closer look. They traveled the remaining distance and cautiously walked among the burning ruins. There were no bodies, and Dean gave voice to his thoughts and hopes. It might be that they had enough warning to get away. We see only destruction here. There are no signs of a fight or of a death. The sand men don't carry off their dead enemies or take time to bury them. Everything here points to the sudden strike of a rapidly moving military campaign, maybe a company of soldiers. They plundered what they wanted and burned the rest. As quickly as they came and destroyed everything, I think it's unlikely that they would take hostages. My guess is that everyone here received word that the sand men were coming and left for San City. Why not Arete? It's much closer than San City. True, and they might have done that, except for two reasons. There is no history of travel to that city. Plus, there were restrictions at the bridge. When we left, we know that there was free entry into the city, but the people here didn't know about that yet. It's only been a day since Arete took over the bridge. Zechariah said, So all indications are that they left for Sand City before the Sand Men arrived here. Yes, and I pray to God that it is true and that they made it. So what do we do now? Dean replied, Fill up our water bottles, make a quick check to see if there's anything here we can use, Alas, my friend, I think we'll need to travel back to the observation point to check on the latest outpost report. We need to be able to act 
based upon more than what we know now. Zechariah's heart ached, but he was nearly driven to madness by the lack of knowledge. He often had to commend Alexandra into God's hands and keep himself going. He replied, Okay, Dean, I'd like to know what the latest report is on Arete, and I'm sure she's greatly concerned about you. However, we have no way of getting a message to her. As they were filling their canteens from the outside well, Dean noted in a cautious tone, They didn't destroy this water source. That means they might be back, or that other military groups will be coming here. But why destroy the buildings if that is the case? Buildings are quick and easy to destroy. This well probably had a line of men waiting to fill their canteens. When the order came to move out, there was neither time nor inclination to fill in or poison the well. Hours later they were back at the observation point, and it wasn't long before a message was relayed. It was from San City to Arete. The communication lookout relayed it to Arete, and Zechariah told Dean what he saw. Dean wrote it out. Sandmen invading. W. Moving. N. S. C. T. Cut off. People from W and S coming to S C. S. D. G. Thinking of Alexandra, Zechariah said more to himself than to Dean. V. D. M. A. God's word remains forever. Dean said, This is most certainly true. Zechariah asked, Should we head back to Arete? Dean answered, Yes, it's the only option we have, but we're going to have to wait until tomorrow. It'll be dark in a couple hours, and we can't travel at night. Let's stay here and find out what the morning reports are. How does that sound to you? Seems fine to me. Our only option, really. Neither man slept well that night. The air was breezy and therefore desert chilly. The ground was rugged and unrelenting. Their minds were fully occupied with thoughts and prayers. They were up and ready early. Dean cautioned about making too many movements or being loud. As the sky lightened, they checked the landscapes around them. Dean spoke softly. Zeke, you keep watching the lookout. I'll scan the closer areas. A company or platoon of sandmen will be easy to spot. Scouts will not. Unless we are careful and quiet, they will likely see us before we see them. Without moving his eyes from the lookout, the young man whispered his okay, even as he smiled. He liked Dean calling him Zeke. He considered it an honor to be in this experienced man's field company and one of his acquaintances. The latter made him ordinary, for there seemed to be thousands who knew Dean. The former made Zechariah extraordinarily blessed, for not many were privileged to travel with him. Then the messages began. Sandmen camped WNNW. SC cut off. No more refugees. Reports from people are of mass murder and complete destruction. Defenses up here, panic, fear, some rioting, some killing, SDG. Dean added, There are many troops in camp between us and San City, Zeke. We can't go east. I hope and pray all those from the Two Sisters place made it to San City. Me too, and hold on, Dean, there's another message. A under siege. We destroyed bridge. A safe. VDMA. Zechariah continued to stare into the distance, although not looking at anything in particular. He said, Alexandra and the others are safe. Thanks be to God. With a heavy sigh, Dean added, And that means we can't go to Arete, so we'll... Wait, there's another message. Had Zechariah not been gazing in thought, he would have missed the last message. L-O-2-A and S-C. Many troops to my S, going dark. Dean, what does that mean? It means that the lookout is in danger of being exposed. There'll be no more communications until they believe they can do so without being discovered. Keeping that lookout is of utmost importance now. The enemy is to the south of that lookout. We are south of the lookout too. But that means the enemy is either between us and the lookout, or to our south as well. If they are south then they are much closer to us, especially if the lookout can see them. Dean continued, True. Part of the Sandmen invasion went to Arete, as the other part turned east to attack San City. Now a third force is moving north to occupy the lands we are in right now. 
So, my friend, we have but one option left to us. Zechariah said, True, we can't really stay here, right? Correct. So we head north? Nope, we're going south. Zechariah exclaimed, What? Chapter 87 Plight and the Refugees The old man in the faded brown shirt fled his ranch after being warned by his granddaughter. She'd been staying with him and helping out on his lifeless ranch. He was a law-abiding citizen who believed that organized religion was a crutch, something for which he had no need. He did good whenever he could, or, at least, in his own mind, he did more good than bad. The scales dipped to his advantage, and he was willing to be judged on that basis. In fact, he often thought he'd insist that God, if he actually existed, judge him that way. His teenage granddaughter ran into the house and in terror told him about the enemy soldiers. They needed to escape while there was still time. If they left immediately and ran part of the way, they could make it to the protection afforded by Sand City. He peered to the west and saw the troops. She urged him to flee with her, and he didn't need convincing. They left, and shortly it became apparent to himself that he had no capacity or ability to run. He suffered physical distress if he pushed himself. So, what occupied his mind until he was murdered less than an hour later? It's strange, but he thought of something Eric Remark wrote in All Quiet on the Western Front. The old man grunted as he believed he was living in that book's land and times. We're no longer young men. We've lost any desire to conquer the world. We are refugees. We are fleeing from ourselves from our lives. We were eighteen years old, and we had just begun to love the world and to love being in it. But we had to shoot at it. The first shell to land went straight for our hearts. We've been cut off from real action, from getting on, from progress. We don't believe in those things anymore. We believe in war. Sand City staggered at the rebellion wrought within by the moles and traitors. These fanned the flames of rioting in certain sectors, particularly those populated by the poorest of the people. Law enforcement officials were overwhelmed and fully occupied with the protection of city properties and civil servants. At the first reports of an invasion, the military deployed to the western and southern limits of the city. Law-abiding citizens quickly brandished their weapons. They discovered abilities necessary to dampen the rioting and restore a measure of order, doing so with the arms in their possession. The refugees fled the advancing enemy and entered a city that had a plan for them, but the city never considered that it might actually be put into action. However, it didn't take long for those assigned to serve to get organized and set up reception areas. The first of the refugees were mostly families. The largest group was made up of the owners, staff, and patrons of the two sisters' place. The pace of these first refugees was brisk, but they weren't running. Those refugees coming from farther out, or who had difficulty walking, were picked off one at a time by the invading enemy. These sand men were relentless, ruthless, brutal, and barbaric. People were beheaded and left on the roadway. The old man, in a faded brown shirt, hurried along as best he could. As he gasped for air, he yelled at his granddaughter, commanding her to run. She refused. The only thing he could do was order her to hurry to the city and get soldiers to come to his aid. She thought that would be the right thing to do to help her grandfather. She ran. She made it to the city. He didn't. He knew he wouldn't have made it, and he was glad to see her within the city limits. Then he was overtaken by the invaders and slain. The Northland soldiers on the perimeter motioned the refugees into the city where community volunteers brought them into the initial reception area. Here they were given water, shade, rest, and any necessary medical attention. The terrified were comforted and reassured that they were safe. The grieving were consoled. If they were able to respond, they were asked a few questions about family, home, and so forth. The volunteers asked a few additional questions. First, did they want to be cared for by the city or by the church or by someone known to them? Each adult had to make that decision. If the latter, they received an escort to that person. If the city was chosen, they were guided to the university. If the church, 
they were led to the tower. The second decision, which was to be made at both university and church, was whether or not they intended to return to their homes outside the city when and if the enemy departed or was defeated, or if they were going to relocate permanently. Fifty-five refugees came to the tower. Only fourteen planned on returning to their homes and work beyond the city. These people were assigned to stay in the homes of parishioners. The large group of forty-one stayed at the tower. This included the two sisters' group. They, like the others, didn't have anything to return to or any work to do. Watchman Pintock and the deacons met all day to discuss what might be done. In the evening a decision was made and a letter written. In the midnight run, that letter was among the mail that Plight took into the tunnels. It was urgent, and Plight was asked to bring a reply back as soon as it was ready. Three nights later, the group of forty-one moved into the tunnels, doing so in groups of seven. The first group entered the labyrinth under the dune a couple hours before midnight. All six groups had to be inside before dawn, and the key to getting them there was Plight. He led the first group through to the central room, where others guided them the rest of the way to the north tower. Plight immediately returned to the tunnel entrance, where Ellie had the next group waiting. After a long drink of water and a bit of food, he led another seven on the first leg of their new life. As dawn was breaking, the last of the refugees followed the weary man into the tunnel. Plight could hardly move when this last charge was turned over to others. He slipped into a side tunnel and fell asleep. In the last three days he had slept little and pushed himself to deliver communications as well as resupply and ready the candles along the way. Once, in a particularly dark section of the lower tunnels, he stopped to catch his breath. He fell over and was asleep before his twisted body hit the ground. When he woke hours later, Plight wasn't sure where he was. He was confused and started in the wrong direction. Plight's mental awareness decreased and his physical exhaustion increased. It was only a matter of time before he made an awful mistake. Never overestimate the strength of the torchbearer's arm, for even the strongest arms grow weary. Rise of the Morning Star by A. J. Darkholm Chapter 88 Dean and Zechariah South? exclaimed Zechariah. That's crazy. Is it? Think about it. What better option do we have? I don't know, admitted the young man. Well, any direction that we head other than south will pit us against front-line troops who are willing and ready to fight. They will kill us before we'd be able to surrender. Besides, they don't take prisoners of war. Really, are we at war? Zeke, it doesn't matter. They are at war. So we head south? Dean said, It's either stay here and die of thirst at best, or head south and do the smart things along the way, to the best of our ability and with the resources we have. In doing so, we are commending ourselves into the nail-pierced hands of God. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to die? You lead, my friend. I'm with you, and I'm following you. Dean grinned and said, I'm first, huh? Zeke kept his eyes focused on the distance and replied with a straight face, You're older. They journeyed to the south and planned a stop at the burned ruins in order to fill their canteens. Dean and Zechariah kept a constant surveillance of the land, but they saw no one. When asked if he sensed anything like he had before, Dean indicated he didn't. As the sun reached its zenith, they knelt in silence as they viewed the scene below them. From the hill above the two sisters' place, everything was quiet. The walk through the burnt ruins was eerie. Few spots continued to smolder. There was nothing left to scrounge, and neither of the men wanted to remain longer than necessary. Canteens were filled and packs rearranged. Dean pointed south and led the way. Zechariah said nothing as he followed. Both kept watch. Whenever they came to the rise of a hill with an overlook or to an area that opened up, they hesitated and surveyed the landscape. In mid-afternoon they spotted Sandman troops traveling north with supplies. These enemy soldiers were close to their left and were unconcerned about possible fighting. They were not part of the elite strike force that drove fast and hard into their targets. 
Dean noted that they carried no weapons. Rather, they were loaded down with heavy supply packs. Still, there was no doubt that they would engage Dean and Zechariah if they were spotted. They waited and watched. Soon they saw more troops. Dean said, Those are combat troops. See how they are armed? Zechariah said nothing. Dean continued, Maybe heading to reinforce or replace front-line troops? These are guys we don't want to engage at all. If we are seen by them, I don't think we'll get away. And I know we won't be able to overpower them. We need to get out of here. If it's okay with you, we should veer to our right and travel in the transitional area between the marsh and this land we're in now. The younger man whispered, What do you mean, if it's okay with me? I don't know anything about this. You're the expert here. Lead on, Dean. A couple hours later, they came to the edge of the swampy land. Dean said he'd go into the marsh and take a look. I should be gone no more than an hour. If I don't come back within two hours, then do the best you can. Go south until you're well into Sandman lands, and then go east until you reach the dune. Then you can make your way north to Sand City. It'll take you more than a week to get there. Find water and avoid the enemy. In all situations, use your head. I don't know if I can do it. You don't know what you haven't done. Dean departed and disappeared into the swamp. Zechariah was left to his observations of the land, the thoughts of his mind, and the silent prayers that were ascending to the Lord his God. Included in his petitions were ones for Alexandra. He knew she was safe, but she knew nothing about his situation or condition. She didn't know if he was even alive. How she must be tormented! He knew that she would pray for him while commending him into Christ's care. He was troubled as well, wondering how in the world they were going to get back together. It seemed so hopeless. Zechariah was feeling fairly sorry for himself when he saw troops to his left. He crouched and spotted even more troops. While most were supply troops, Zechariah saw there were combat troops as well. They had marched along a road that appeared to be almost straight ahead of them. He tried to think like Dean and make a short-term plan. Stay low and move into the edge of the marsh. Wait until dark and then move south. It was only minutes later when Dean suddenly approached. He moved quickly and motioned Zechariah to stay low and quiet. He whispered, The edge of the marsh is filled with Sandman soldiers. The military leaders must be driving them hard, for they don't like being in the marsh at all. They are close, just inside the swamp. We can't stay here. Let's move to the left, to the east. No, I just saw soldiers, some of them combat troops, to the left. They came from a way that is almost directly ahead of us. Dean remained silent for several minutes. He turned and looked behind them. He was going to suggest retreating a bit and coming up with another plan. That wasn't going to happen. The enemy was now behind them. Well, Zeke, it looks like I've led us into a trap. Zechariah looked back and said, Well, Dean, we can come up with something, can't we? Dean looked at him and made no expression for a long moment. Then his demeanor changed, and he said, Give me a minute. Finally, he moved over to a place where there was an old tree and located a dead branch. He brought it over. Remove the small branches, but leave those two large branches making up the natural fork. Showing a point on each branch, Dean said, Break off each of the forked branches here, but make sure you do it quietly. After following the instructions, Zechariah held a five-foot-long branch with a two-foot Y at the end. Get your canteen and take a long drink. You may not have another opportunity for hours. Meanwhile, Dean took a length of rope from his pack and cut two lengths from it with his knife. He wound one length around Zechariah's neck and attached the ends to the two branches of the Y. Zechariah's head was now fixed into the Y. What are you doing? Quiet. Dean took the other piece of rope and tied the ends together. Put your hands behind your back and into this loop. Zechariah did so. Now rotate one hand so that the rope twists and tightens. Now you appear to be securely tied. You can quickly get loose by rotating your same hand the other way. Try it. Zechariah did so a couple of times. Okay, now keep them secure. You are my prisoner. 
As Zechariah did this, Dean made a fist and hit Zechariah with his middle knuckle just under one eye. Zechariah recoiled and protested silently. Immediately a monkey bump formed under his eye, which was soon nearly swollen shut. Dean did the same with the other eye. Zechariah looked like he'd taken a severe beating. Zechariah moaned in pain. Silence! Dean took the canteen and poured a small amount of water over the young man's head. With his knife concealed behind Zechariah's head, Dean swiftly brought it over the top and cut the prisoner's head. It was a small but deep cut at the hairline. Zechariah kept his mouth closed as he uttered a guttural protest. Zeke, you've got to be quiet. He whispered a reply. Just tell me what you're going to do and give me some warning. Okay, next time. Zechariah mocked. Next time, funny. His head wound bled profusely and the water reinforced the illusion that he'd nearly been scalped. Dean sprinkled a handful of dust and dirt as he finished the look that Zechariah had been severely beaten. Finally, Dean took a black balaclava from his pack and put it on. He stuffed the canteens, food, Zechariah's journal, and pack into his own pack and left the rest behind. With Zechariah's hands bound and with his neck secured in the Y of the stick, they moved from their hiding spot. As Dean walked his prisoner in the direction of the Sandman-infested road to the south, he spoke softly from under the hood. Don't say a word until we are completely in the clear. Groan and grunt when I jerk or push the branch. Beyond that, don't draw any attention to yourself. I'll keep you informed whenever I get the opportunity. You're my prisoner, and I'm taking you back to an undisclosed location. You're insane. Thanks, I know. Now let's move out. By the way, aren't you glad that Alexandra is not with us now? There would have been no escape for any of us. You and I would have simply been killed with a couple swings of a scimitar. It wouldn't have been so for her. They would have kept her alive and brutalized her for years. Oh, God, that's horrible to think about. Yes, I'm so thankful she's safe in Arete. I pray that we'll be together some day. Me too. Dean timed their entry onto the roadway so that it was when a group of supply soldiers were heading north. Zechariah's wound continued to bleed, with the blood running down his face, on his neck, and into his shirt. The troops looked at Zechariah with amazement and mocked him. There were cheers and jeers as they passed one another. The next group was a short distance away. Good. Now we've established ourselves as not being out of line. There's a big test coming. The next are combat soldiers. Okay. Shh. Hang your head in shame. The Sandman combat soldiers stopped as Dean and Zechariah approached. Several of them moved to block the way. As soon as the leader began to confront them, Dean uttered a deep, guttural, tongueless, The declaration stopped everyone from movement or interference. In a threatening, defiant manner, Dean turned his head in their direction and stared them down. He pushed the forked stick forward, Zechariah choked, and it wasn't a deception. He was playing his part to the fullest and forced himself to allow the choke. The strangle that came forth was completely genuine, as was the spittle that drooled down his blood-soaked, dirty, swollen face. After passing by and being momentarily clear of the enemy troops, Dean reported, We're clear for another minute or so. Good job on your end of things. Zechariah replied, you pretended to be Hashasasim? That was insane and incredible. Stay with it. We'll continue doing the same thing as we head south. It looks like we have a long line of supply, logistics, and support personnel. The line is so long and slow that it may be ten or fifteen minutes before we can speak. We can't stop now so you can have a drink. I'm okay. The two kept up this mode of escape for the next few hours. Whenever they were confronted, Dean uttered the imposing ha 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 see. It worked every time. Those challenging were stunned and backed off immediately, often assisted by nearby men. Amazingly, there were cheers applauding the capture and treatment of an infidel. Zechariah wondered if Dean didn't have a morsel of enjoyment at such expressions. The old man nodded his head slowly and confidently to the source of the cheering. The closer the troops were to each other, 
the longer the accolades continued, which made the ruse that much more successful. In the late afternoon, when they had time to speak freely, Zechariah began to slow down and occasionally stumbled. Zeke, you okay? Water. Yeah, me too. I've got to get out of this balaclava. I think it's about time for us to move away from the road. The troops have thinned out, and there's a high sweeping turn to the southwest ahead. If it's clear, when we get to the top of the hill, we'll duck to the left and go southeast. Fine. I'm just not sure how much more of this I can handle. More than you imagine. Their departure from the road was successful. As far as Dean could tell, no one saw them. Although they still had to be careful, their penetration south was sufficient to keep them away from the Sandman troops. Every step east, even a stumbling one, was a step in the direction of freedom. They walked about twenty minutes when they came to an area where they were unseen and could take a break. Dean shed his balaclava and Zechariah his shackles. They salvaged the short lengths of rope and tossed the forked branch. They reassembled their packs, and together they drank from their canteens, forcing themselves not to drink too much. After eating some food and another sip of water, they surveyed their situation. See that plateau to the southeast? Yeah. We need to get to the top of that and then go directly east. Two good days of travel will put us at the edge of the sand dune. From there we'll make our way north to Sand City. Will that way be safe? Don't know. We'll find out that if we make it that far. What do you mean? Water. Hopefully we find some between here and the base of the plateau. I don't recall any water sources up there. You've been here before? Not decades ago. Stared at the stars and pondered the meaning of life. Really? No, I was kidding you. I went up there to see a man about a wombat. Let's get moving. With that, Dean looked back for any enemy troops and seeing none, they moved in the direction of the plateau. Zechariah shook his head and continued to follow him. Chapter 89 The Supreme Ruler Two military members of the Sandman forces and one citizen, a man charged with leading the cells, were led through the balcony doors where the Supreme Ruler was waiting. They had been summoned to brief him on the activities of their army, the invasion, and the subversive activities in Sand City. The Supreme Ruler remained facing away from his visitors as he commanded, Report on the Western Invasion. One of the military men immediately started. His life depended on emphasizing the Supreme Ruler's brilliance and success, and yet doing so without fawning. Yes, sir. This report is based upon the situation as of two days ago. Your orders have been followed exactly as given. Your forces traveled through the western swamps and mustered north of the marshlands. From there, a two-pronged attack was launched. The left prong drove swiftly and deeply to the northwest, doing so all the way to the chasm of Arete. The cowards in that city destroyed the bridge across the chasm. Your brave forces were not able to enter the city, but remain as a siege force and at the ready. The swift action of your forces cut off any escape for the infidels who wanted to find refuge in the city. Why didn't Musa send an advanced team to secure the bridge before it could be destroyed? The man remained at attention. His answer was purposeful, with the desire to be able to leave this briefing alive. The brutality and impulsiveness of the supreme ruler was well known. Sir, that is a question for which no answer was given to convey to you. It is a question that will be asked of him when I return. Continue. Continue was good. It meant going on. The man breathed a sigh of relief, even though he was far from being done and not yet sent back to his assignment in the field. Sir, according to your battle strategy and plan, the right prong drove deeply and speedily to the northeast. This cut off any of the middle country people from escaping into Sand City. From there, the invasion force turned east and moved against Sand City. The man stopped speaking. He had no inclination to report on the lack of food and water in all of the areas. The supreme ruler faced the man and commanded, Continue. Sir, tell me about the invasion entering into and the taking over of Sand City. Sir, as of two days ago, your forces were fighting at the western edge of Sand City. What is the situation in the land between the two prongs? Sir, that country is totally devoid of people now. 
those found were tortured and executed. Why hasn't Musa driven my army into San City, that city of the infidels? Sir, that information was not part of the report to be delivered to you. It will be asked of Musa when I return. The cold eyes of the supreme ruler fixed on the man. Finally he ordered, Go to Musa, tell him I want the dimensions of the chasm, how deep it is, and how far across. It must be filled for us to gain access to Arete. Musa will be thrown over the edge. He will be the first of the debris to be dumped into it. In that way, Musa will lead us into Arete. The man turned pale and forced a reply. Yes, sir. The supreme ruler returned to his distant gaze and said, Report on the Eastern Campaign. The second military man was in a horrendous position, and he knew it. Sir, that campaign will begin when enough troops are assembled and trained. It hasn't begun, the supreme ruler noted. Why is that? Why have they not assembled? It's how far from our city to the assault staging area? Three miles? And what is this about training? How much training is needed in order to use a stick to kill someone? Uh, sir, except for a handful of us, all of your military forces are engaged in the two-pronged attack. At the staging point for the Eastern Campaign, we only have the men and boys of the city. They have been drafted and are being force-marched to the staging area. They must be constantly watched or else they desert. They are like chickens, and, as your faithful soldiers, we end up chasing chickens. You need to kill a few chickens. These men need to witness the killing of a few chickens. Do you know how to kill a chicken? I could show you right here, right now. The man was rattled and could only gulp out his reply. We know, we know. The supreme ruler instantly fumed. He glided to the man, and, with their noses almost touching, he exploded. Incompetence is one thing. Disrespect is another thing altogether. That is inexcusable. You have spoken to me without the courtesy of saying, Sir, that is most disrespectful. He raised his voice and directed it to the doors. Guards! They entered and stood at attention before him. In unison they said, Sir, ring the neck of this chicken. Yes, sir. The man made a move to run, but was stopped before he could take a step. One guard moved behind him and broke down his knees. The other guard attacked him. With a quick twist and a sickening snap, the man's neck was wrung. The supreme ruler said in a bored voice, the chicken is dead. He turned to the third man and approached him. Report. Sir, yes. It was clumsy, but it was simply evidence that the first word out of his mouth was going to be, sir. He continued with his report. The cells are all engaged in their assignments. The moles have been activated and are carrying out their various missions. These are primarily affecting the economy and public morale. Instigators are at work even though there is little patience for those rioting. Spies remain covert in order to gain information. They have organized this part of the plan quite well, and everything is proceeding on schedule. Dismissed. The two remaining men said, Yes, sir. Wait, ordered the Supreme Ruler. Did Musa mention anything about the solution to the little problem of a certain hit list? The military man answered him, Sir, that problem has been eliminated. That was a lie, but it was what the supreme ruler wanted to hear. And besides, how could it be proven to be a lie, unless, of course, someone on the hit list was suddenly assassinated? Chapter 90 Dean and Zechariah Two days after finding a small source of water, filling their canteens, and making their way to the flat surface of the plateau, Dean and Zechariah slept soundly. Five men suddenly confronted them. These men positioned themselves so the morning sun beamed into the eyes of the two slumbering foreigners. Two of the men were in their late teens. They stayed back as the two middle-aged men remained in their confronting positions. An old man leaned on his staff and kept an eye on the two ragged men. He pointed his staff at Zechariah. Dean spoke and startled the men, for they supposed him to be asleep. You need to work on your sneaking skills. You made all kinds of noise as you tried to get between us and the morning sun. Very poor performance. 
One of the middle-aged men noticed the old man's staff pointing at Zechariah and asked, Were you wounded in the fighting? Zechariah hesitated. He wasn't sure how to respond. If he said that he was, he would be identified as an enemy combatant not wearing a uniform. Spies were executed immediately. If he said he wasn't wounded in the fighting, an explanation would be required. He didn't know how to respond to that. Dean began to answer, This youngster... The same inquisitor demanded, No, he must answer. Zechariah replied, I cut my head and... Why did you cut your head? I didn't cut my head. You just said you did. Which lie do you want me to believe? I meant my head was cut, but I didn't cut it. So, someone else cut it? Yes. Who? You're trying to deceive us. It won't work. Dean interrupted. I think the lad may have some mental issues. Perhaps the nasty knock on the head resulted in more serious medical problems than I first considered. He wasn't entirely with it before the head injury. Just a tad off, you understand. So, just how far is it to the head doctor? The old man pointed his staff at Dean. The questioner obeyed the old man. He turned to Dean and demanded, Why are you here? Dean answered, I'm here to see a man about a wombat. The questioner looked at Dean with disdain. It seemed the only thing that restrained him was the lack of a go-ahead from his elder leader. The elder man remained focused and non-committal. Then, slowly, his demeanor changed from a suspicious scowl to a toothy grin. A hearty laugh followed. Then he proclaimed, <laughs> Dean. Dean returned his greeting with an equally joyful bellow, <laughs> Ibrahim. Aha, boys, this is the famous, or rather, the infamous Dean, about whom I have told you many stories. One or two of them might even be true. You have sons? asked Dean. Yes, a handful. These are two of my sons, Jeb and Enoch. These are two of my grandchildren, Lucas and Marcus. There are many more for you to meet when you return to our home. Please, who is this with you? He looks like he could use some doctoring. Your son? Dean replied, This is Zechariah. I call him Zeke, but he's not my son. Well, we shall not call him Zeke without his permission, lest it be a bestowed term of endearment. You may call me Zeke, and since I never knew my father, Dean is my adopted father, in addition to being my spiritual father. Ibrahim asked, And why are you two out exploring such dangerous places and in such precarious times? Dean spoke, Zeke and I left Arete and are trying to make our way to Sand City and then on to the North Tower. There is an invasion of Sandmen, and it isn't going to end soon. Arete is under siege, and there are battlefields to the west of Sand City. We left Arete just before the siege and couldn't get to Sand City because of the invasion. Madeline's alehouse and Quinn's home cooking has been completely destroyed. The Sandmen are taking no prisoners. I believe they are especially brutal when they find out they have captured a Christian. We hope and pray that everyone at the Two Sisters' place was able to make it to Sand City. Likely there are refugees flooding into the city from the surrounding areas, farms, and ranches. What have you heard? Uh, not much. We're isolated here. We did see smoke to the northwest, and now know it was probably the Two Sisters' place. There doesn't seem to be much troop build-up or fighting east of here all the way to the dune. But you said something about North Tower. What is that? We'll fill you in on that after a while. Ah, replied Ibrahim in self-chastising tone. Where are my manners? Let's get you to our home where water, medical attention, food, and the rest of our family are waiting. As we walk together, we can talk. What awaits you two in the place called North Tower? Dean answered, Zeke here is going to be ordained and installed as watchman in the new congregation there. Ibrahim stopped and asked Zechariah, have you received the call to be a watchman there? Yes, he replied. And, sir, if I may be so bold as to ask, have you accepted that call? Yes, I have. Then I must, boys, we must address this son of the prophets as watchman Zechariah, for it is the call that makes a qualified man a watchman. His ordination and installation are public acknowledgments of the call that has been accepted. 
We're honored to be in your company and share our home with Watchman Zechariah and with you, Dean. Dean grinned and asked, So, may I assert that it is proper for me to call this spiritual son of mine Father Zechariah? Zechariah shook his head in continued wonder. Dean seemed to be beyond human. How could anyone have all the experiences, traveled all the places, known so many people, be so well educated, so common, and, based on their recent escape, so instantly resourceful? Zechariah had grown so fond of simply listening to Dean and being with him. He continued to be surprised, and he often wondered at all that he didn't know about him. Ibrahim admitted his inability to answer Dean's inquiry. I'm sure I don't know. Would you explain how it is proper for you to call your son Zeke, Father Zechariah? Dean said, I read about it once in an articulation of the Fourth Commandment, the honoring of father and mother. It was in Martin Luther's large catechism. Thus we have three kinds of fathers presented in this commandment, fathers by blood, father of a household, and fathers of the nation. Besides these, there are also spiritual fathers, not like those in the papacy who applied this title to themselves, but performed no fatherly office, for the name spiritual father belongs only to those who govern and guide us by the word of God. St. Paul boasts that he is a father in 1 Corinthians 4.15, where he says, I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Since such persons are fathers, they are entitled to honor even above all others. Ibrahim said, I see. Well, I find nothing I could disagree with in that quotation. In fact, it is what I practice and teach, as well as expect from my family. Zechariah responded, Dean, you read about it once? What do you have, a photographic memory? Dean answered him, I read something about a photographic memory one time, but I don't recall what it said. But, if I may be so bold, Zechariah interjected quickly, You are. I'm what? So bold. Dean continued, Okay, true. My advice and counsel to you, Father Zechariah, is this. Do not, under any circumstances, try to outdo Ibrahim in reciting scriptures. In fact, if the family tradition has continued, don't even think about challenging his youngest grandchild. You'll lose, and it won't be pretty. Zechariah responded, I've learned to abide by such counsel from this man, so I won't be entertaining any contest with you or anyone from your family. Ibrahim spoke, It isn't my place or the place of any member of my family to embarrass one of Christ's watchmen. My boys already know that. I'm repeating it, for repetition is worthwhile not only in memorizing scripture, but in practicing good manners. Remind the others at home. The two sons and two grandsons nodded and spoke their assent in unison. Dean saw them approaching a homestead and asked, Lily? Yes, came Ibrahim's reply. She's there and still the better half. There she is now, outside by the garden. Dean said, Ah, yes, alas, Ibrahim, I confess you've aged over the decades since we last walked together. Lily, however, seems only to have become well-seasoned. Zechariah stifled a grin, looking instead at Lily's husband, who was smiling. He couldn't tell if he was smiling at what Dean said, or if he was looking in loving affection at his wife. Zechariah thought of Alexandra and found himself with the advent of a slight smile. Later that evening, after food, drink, cleaning up, and much storytelling, Ibrahim asked if watchman Zechariah might speak to them about the presence of God among the faithful people in the diaspora, where there might not be a watchman to minister to them. Zechariah agreed to do so. He began, Is God present everywhere? They all agreed that he is. Is God graciously present everywhere? They didn't know how to respond. Well, okay, let's examine an example from the Word of God. After Adam and Eve sinned, does anyone remember what they did? One of the grandchildren blurted out, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Another grandchild said, Genesis 3.8 Correct. Very good job. They hid themselves from the presence of God. 
But wasn't God present everywhere? Yes, the children said. So, there is a difference between God being present everywhere and us being in His gracious presence. To be in His presence where His gifts of forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life are given to us? Yes, the children repeated. The adults nodded agreement in various ways. Do we find Him in His gracious presence, or does He find us and bring us into it? They waited. Well, did Adam and Eve go looking for God after they sinned and left His gracious presence, or did He seek them? Someone answered, He went after them. Yes, continued Zechariah, the Son of God came to them with His word of law, Where are you? The law of God always accuses the old Adam in us. Adam had been created in the image of God and after his likeness. Genesis 1.27 came a reply, and Zechariah chuckled. But when Adam sinned, he lost that image and that likeness. We are now born in the fallen image of Adam. Genesis 5.3 Zechariah said, What do you mean? And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. Genesis 5.3 A deep-throated admonition as from an old lion sounded forth from Ibrahim's throat. Dude! The youngster noted the admonition and said, I'm sorry, grandfather. The old man nodded and said, You are forgiven in the name of Jesus. Zechariah considered it to be a true blessing to be in this home. He continued, Now, remember, Adam and Eve stood accused, but God didn't want it to be that way, so he gave them the promise of a Savior. He gave his word. The Holy Spirit used that word to give them the gift of faith to believe that promise. They were forgiven of all their sins. They were right with God, and they were once again in his gracious presence. So, is God able to be graciously present here with you? Yes, the children said once again. Has he promised to be graciously present here with you? Yes. Where is that promise written? No one replied. Zechariah started. For where two or three are gathered together in my name... He hesitated. The children quickly finished. There am I in the midst of them. Two or three children continued. Matthew 18.20 You're correct, but remember... It's not just where two or three Christians are gathered together. It's where they are gathered together in His name. You were first in His name when you were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28.20 20. Yes, and that's why we begin each divine service in His name. You can make the sign of the cross if you want. It reminds you that you have been redeemed by Christ the crucified and that you have been crucified with Christ. One of the older children said, Galatians 2.20. Yep, said Zechariah, and continued, I know that you do your memory work every morning. Do you begin with these words? He looked at Ibrahim, who nodded in the negative. Well, you don't have to, but some people do. Since he is the honored spiritual head of this family, you could ask Father Ibrahim to begin your session with those words. They are called the invocation, which means to call upon. When we gather together in His name, we are calling upon Him to be graciously present among us, just as He has promised. We could do that this evening. Would you like that? Yes, came the reply from everyone, although some only nodded their heads in affirmation. Ibrahim smiled. He liked this young man. He was, what was the word that he remembered from his youth? He was, that's it, he was pastoral. Okay, after I say the invocation, you respond with Amen, which means, yes, yes, this is most certainly true. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, everyone said, Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Zechariah timed a hesitation that indicated the others were to respond. They did so, saying in unison, Who made heaven and earth? Psalm 124, verse 8, came a snappy reply, Grins and giggles followed. All right, continued Zechariah. This would be a good time for some of your recitations of the scriptures. Then there could be everyone speaking the Apostles' Creed, a few prayers, the Lord's Prayer, and then a closing word, something like this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Second Corinthians 13.14 Zechariah said in response, and with a grin directed at the adults, 
Excellent. You got it. From now on, you children won't have to add those references. Now, sometimes people like to have a bit of commentary or application of one specific text. This is usually done after the creed is confessed. I don't have a full devotion book with me, but I do have my journal in order to give you an example. Here, Zechariah reached into his pack and pulled out his journal and placed it on the table. The reaction was immediate. The younger grandchildren became instantly afraid and looked to their parents. The women hugged and soothed them. The men and older boys went to the doors and the windows as if someone might be lurking about and watching what was happening inside. Even Ibrahim rose with a concerned expression and covered the candle but didn't extinguish it. Dean remained seated and passive. Zechariah was shocked. He stood and exclaimed a series of bewildered questions. What have I done? How, how have I offended you? I, I'm sorry. What is it I've done? Ibrahim raised a hand slightly, indicating everyone should remain quiet. It's okay, he said in a quiet voice. One of the men stepped back inside the door and said, I don't see anyone outside. The dogs haven't barked, so I don't think anyone is here. Ibrahim spoke. Everyone settle. Watchman Zechariah, I ask that you please put your book away and out of sight. Zechariah did as asked and said, I don't understand. We know, said Ibrahim. We're Christians living in the land of the Sandmen and among many Sandmen people. As such, we're outlaws. If someone were to find out that we were Christians, we would all be executed. We're part of the Diaspora, which is why I asked about that before. As Christians, we are followers of Christ and children of the book, yet we can't have a Bible in our possession. If anyone finds us with any book at all, well, that puts us under suspicion. People are beheaded for no other reason than that they are suspicious. Zechariah understood and said, So openly putting my journal on the table endangered the whole family? Ibrahim replied, Well, maybe just a little. Really, how rare would it be that a sandman was standing outside one of our windows tonight and saw you put a book on our table? In addition, he was able to do so without the dogs noticing and barking. So, you just startled us. We apologize for our reaction. Zechariah said, I understand. What I did was like placing a bomb on your kitchen table. So, this is why you have such emphasis on memorizing? Yes, how much of the scriptures do you have memorized? Ibrahim answered, My grandfather departed this world to be with Christ before my father had been able to finish Second Chronicles. Half of that book is lost to us. Zechariah was astonished and said, You have the rest memorized? Yes, but there are some hazy parts, especially with the numbers in numbers. I am humbled, admitted Zechariah. Ibrahim desired to change the focus of the discussion and said, Watchman Zechariah, I greatly appreciate the form for our daily devotions. We'll begin using it tomorrow morning. There's something else that I'd greatly appreciate knowing from you before you leave us in a couple weeks. Certainly, however I might be able to help, but I do think that we'll be leaving much sooner, right, Dean? Yes, whenever Ibrahim is heading to the city market with a wagon of goods. But that is in two days, replied Ibrahim with a note of objection in his voice. Zechariah returned the discussion to the request, saying to Ibrahim, You mentioned that I might be able to help in another way. How might that be? He answered, Obviously, we have the scriptures, and we do the best we can in understanding and applying them. But I think we need help with that. Can you give us some guidelines on how to do that so we don't interpret them incorrectly? The watchman said, Yes, upon your approval, sir, I can do that as part of the morning devotion tomorrow. He thought a moment and made a revision. Actually, it might be better for tomorrow evening. It might get a bit long. Excellent, said the old man. We look forward to it. The next evening, after the confession of the creed, watchman Zechariah spoke. There are many principles for correctly understanding what God the Holy Spirit is conveying to us through the word. We're going to focus on three of them. The first and most important doctrine of Christianity is that the sinner is declared right with God by His grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You all know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 
How about you women and girls reciting it together? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. You can also refer to Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 31. That is helpful not only because it affirms the gospel, which is the central teaching of Christianity, but because it refers to God's law. That leads us into the second most important doctrine, the proper distinction of the law and the gospel. Every section of scripture is either law or gospel. The law tells us what to do and not do, say and not say, think and not think, be and not be. The law shows us our sin, SOS. The gospel tells us what God has done for us to redeem us and to grant us the gift of faith in him. The gospel shows us our Savior, SOS. One verse that has both law and gospel is Romans 6.23. Men and boys, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You got it. There's one more, but that should probably wait until another time. Maybe we should have the spiritual head of this house lead us in prayer and the closing parts of our devotion. They did, and Ibrahim said he would be taking a wagon of goods to the city market in the morning, and perhaps the watchman could speak to him of the third principle on the way to the city. Dean said they would be leaving with him. Zechariah nodded his head in agreement with both of his elders.